The thing about bosses is that typically they're bigger, stronger, scarier and better paid than you. And also in video games. But if there's one thing our accumulated years of playing games have taught us, it's that bosses have weaknesses. You know, weak spots or foibles you can attack for massive damage, or at least out of which you can exploit the ever-loving heck. What's more, that weakness isn't always their face or their glowing weak spot or the glowing weak spot in their face. Wait, what? It isn't? Huh. Well now I can't wait to find out about these weak spots that bosses don't want you to know about. Beware of spoilers for the following games. The name's Andre Almeida. I am a man with a plan. The people will come to me for salvation. Andre Almeida from Killer7 must be a pretty smart guy. He's already chairman and CEO of a multinational corporation at the age of only 27. He's not smart enough, though, to not make it his hobby to inject himself with a variety of exotic diseases. I infected myself with all kinds of deadly viruses. I overcame them time after time, discovering vaccines and creating medicine all the way. The latest virus he's injected himself with, Heaven Smile, unfortunately drives him mad with the urge to kill, launches his head into the sky, and turns his blood into lethal poison that kills everyone in the surrounding area. <laughs> On the plus side, if you come down with that, no one's going to argue with you taking a day off work. Ooh. You're already at work. Oh, uh, yeah. Of course, with everyone within a five mile radius dead from blood, that leaves you to stop Andre by shooting him in his weak spot, which is his now brightly coloured hair. Now, I know what you're thinking. Surely everyone's weak spot is their hair, insofar as if you shoot them in the head, they die. It's not quite that straightforward with Andre because his hair doesn't necessarily stay attached to his head during this boss fight. Andre goes down pretty quickly, though, once you manage to sneak behind him and put a bullet in his barnet. <laughs> Guess you were on a hair trigger. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. You have wasted so many chances. Tis not the first time that you have disappointed me. Open world fantasy role playing game Two Worlds won't only be remembered for being the poor man's oblivion. It'll also be remembered as the game with a final boss you could defeat in the first five minutes if you knew that boss's secret weakness, which was pissed off villagers. The boss in question was the dark wizard Gandahar, a fantasy villain straight out of central casting with his death robes, menacing voice and giant evil shoulder pads. I have had enough of you. Right at the beginning of the game, this Sauron cosplayer is hanging out just a short country walk from your starting point. The budget Dark Knight is probably feeling pretty confident right now since he has like 40,000 health and your noob starter sword hits for like 10. And as is right and proper, if you have a cheeky pop at the undead sheriff of Nottingham here this early on in the game, you get a big flamey beatdown. <laughs> if you cheese it back to the nearby village, however, Gandahar's noob-seeking missile still toasts your marshmallows, yes. <laughs> But it also pisses off the locals, who don't take kindly to collateral damage. At this point, we learn that Gandahar's greatest weakness is an angry mob of peasants, who bat him around like an evil piñata full of dark magic and eventually kill him. <laughs> and that's how you complete two worlds. Congratulations, you've just saved 20 hours. 20 hours! Think of what you could do with all that. Time saved. Could watch a season of 24 without the ads. Quiet from Metal Gear Solid 5 is a sniper who's so good at sniping you almost forget that she's dressed like a backup dancer from Madonna's Who's That Girl tour. This is down to Quiet's enhanced abilities. At the start of the game, she takes an on-fire tumble out of a window courtesy of Kiefer Sutherland-voiced butt model Ishmael, and can only be saved with mutant parasites that also grant her superhuman abilities. 
In fact, Quiet is so perceptive and so good with a firearm that, at Ocelot's request, she's able to shoot between the rotor blades of a helicopter, something that is so impressive that honestly, you'd think you could make more money doing that than sniping. That is at least worth a one-off Netflix special. You could call it Quiet on the Set. Quiet Riot? I have more. Regardless, arming someone with these incredible abilities with a high-powered sniper rifle, an intimate knowledge of the terrain and all of the high ground she needs means that this boss fight against her is seriously formidable. I mean, sure, Venom Snake is good, but judging by how many bits of him are missing at this point, your money's got to be on Quiet, right? The answer is yes, until you realise that Quiet's supernatural situational awareness doesn't extend vertically. You can be crouched half a mile away behind a wall, but pop your head out for an eighth of a second, and there'll be another new bit of Venom Snake they'll have to replace with unlikely technology. But call in a supply drop to Quiet's position, and she is somehow totally unaware of the sound of a jet aircraft flying directly overhead, along with the sound and shadow produced by a massive crate slowly descending toward her via parachute. Look out, boss. Take cover. There's a laser sight trained on your head. If that's not enough, it actually takes two supply crate drops to defeat Quiet on normal difficulty. So she falls for it twice. I guess you could say she's in Quiet the Spot of Bother? Told you I had more. Call me, Netflix. It's okay. I'm not gonna hurt you. <laughs> Just walked in the door and already presenting. Dead Rising 3 boss Dylan Fuentes appears to have a lot of pent up tension. Seven of the psychopath enemies in the game each stand for one of the seven deadly sins, and Dylan represents lust, as evidenced by the kinky outfit, the obsession with pole dancing, and the fact that he lives in the back of a sex shop. Rent's cheap, and you get as much edible underwear as you can eat. Slash wear. And then there's Dylan's custom flamethrower, which is shaped like, I don't know actually, but that shape looks awfully familiar. Daddy. <gasps> no, it's gone. Anyway, Dylan's a reasonably tough cookie in spite of his relatively weedy frame and non-combat appropriate clothing. But he does have a weakness that you can turn to your advantage. You see, he spends the whole fight nagging you to do some pole dancing. Please me, is that so hard to do? Actually perform a pole dance though, and you'll briefly force Dylan into a cooldown state, where he's vulnerable to a grapple attack which absolutely rinses his health. <laughs> and all because you shook your tush for a few seconds in his grubby sex lair. <laughs> now I don't mean to criticise Nick, but that's more dancing near a pole than actual pole dancing. Let's see your hip lock walk down. Full marks for the outfit though. Hot. Of all the disgusting, megalomaniacal villains who've ever sacrificed their humanity in the name of imposing their perfect vision of society on humankind, the master from Fallout is one. Unity will bring about the master race. Master. Master! One able to survive. Or even thrive in the wasteland. Formerly a quite clever human being, the Master is now an extremely clever flesh monster, mutated by the forced evolutionary virus into an abomination of stringy meat and CRT displays. Do you join the Unity, or do you die here? Join. Die. Join. Die. Top guy. He's poised to bring about the extinction of the human race to make way for his own race of mutants, who he thinks are superior because he's more into genetic modification than whatever farmer it was who grew this yellow cucumber. It's a banana. Oh. Whatever, he looks like a melted Ken doll, and if you want to stop him, you will either have to fight him, which is hard, and he has lasers. Or, since the Master is such a fan of science, you can do a science on him and defeat him with an autopsy report that proves his precious mutants are all sterile. Therefore, they won't be having any tiny mutant babies. Therefore, his plans to rule the world with a mutant race are null and void. But it cannot be. This would mean that... All my work... ...has been for nothing. Everything that I've tried to... A, a failure! It can't be... be, be, be. Having been science dunked on by you, the master commits suicide and you stroll out of there with nary a gatling laser fired. And hey, can someone get a janitor in here? This place is gross.
Glorious Theatre is a level of psychonauts that takes place inside the mind of an actress, complete with her own inner critic, the vitriolic Jasper Rolls. I've seen some bad plays in my day, but this one's an actual menace, and it's all her fault. You might be of the opinion that sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. Tell that to Jasper, who, when you finally get to fight him at the end of Glorious Theatre, starts flying around the room in his theatre box, firing deadly criticism at you from twin fountain pen cannons. Luckily for us, I handle criticism extremely well, so this shouldn't be a problem. Uh, go again. THAT COULD WORK UNDER THESE CONDITIONS! At first glance, Jasper appears to be totally invulnerable, a state that isn't helped by his constant criticism. Your fighting is weak, uninspired, and flat as a man. Look, I'm trying, alright, Jasper? You soon discover, however, that Jasper has a weird weakness. He's super vulnerable to being in the spotlight. To defeat Jasper, you first need to make him vulnerable by lighting him with a spotlight in what is perhaps a dig at critics, being able to dish out criticism but being unable to handle the spotlight themselves. At least he can give the spotlight a bad review. Take that wretched regurgitator of the sun! Anyway, three doses of the spotlight and Jasper goes down for good, thank goodness, because I don't know how much more of that I could have taken. What's the matter? Can't you take a little... <sighs> Criticism. I think it's pretty obvious that I can't, Jasper! Officially, Yu Yevon is Final Fantasy X's chief antagonist. Unofficially, he's a giant bed bug. The important thing, though, is that once upon a time, this guy was the summoner who created the mega monster known as Sin. And for that, Yu Yevon winds up at the top of Tidus' list of people and things who he needs to kick in the butt. Or if it's a giant bedbug, the region equivalent to the butt. Everyone, this is the last time we fight together. Okay? Huh? This is right at the end of the game, by the way, when we already know that Tidus was dead all along-ish, and that when he defeats Yu Yevon, he'll disappear. Just go with it. What I'm trying to say is, after we beat you, Yevon, I'll disappear. <laughs> okay, Titus. Not everything is about you, all right? I know it's selfish, but this is my story. Anyways, for an ancient, unknowable flea monster, Yu Yevon has a weakness that's unexpectedly ordinary. His kryptonite is the Phoenix Down. You know, the resurrection dealie that revives characters. They kill him. Phoenix down. I've got a backpack full of them. They're everywhere. It's like being weak against canned soup. So you can bypass the gruelling back and forth of turn-based combat of a proper fight and win this endgame battle by first using a zombie attack, which confers zombie status on your enemy. Then, because your enemy is undead, all you have to do is chuck a phoenix down on him, which makes him unrevive, also known as die, and he's done, son! Haha, <laughs> look at him! He's so angry, or scared, quietly dignified, hungry? I don't know. Are we even sure that was you, Yevon? You look like a bug. <laughs> Kelidemus is the boss of the Forbidden Woods dungeon in Legend of Zelda Wind Waker and is the angriest bit of greenery this side of the Incredible Hulk. Link heads to the Forbidden Woods early in the game to rescue a Korok who fell into the woods while flying over them, because apparently we can't spare even one Korok, despite there being about a million of the bloody things all over the place, as anyone who played Breath of the Wild can tell you. <laughs> Twee hee! Thanks a lot, idiot. Caledemos is a formidable foe, as giant carnivorous plants go, whipping at you with electrified vines and sending burrowing roots after you that can hit you from below. If you're fighting it the proper way, you have to use your newly acquired boomerang to sever the vines holding him to the ceiling, bringing him crashing to the floor, at which point it will reveal its weak point, finally allowing you to score some damage before it closes up and you have to repeat the process. However, Kaladamos has a very specific weakness that wasn't discovered until 14 years after the game released. 
In the game, there's a piece of heart side quest that requires you to take forest water, which is a special kind of water only found in the forest haven, and which only lasts for 20 minutes, which you can use to heal the withered trees found throughout the Great Sea. But if you take that forest water and use it on Caledemos, it will have the exact opposite effect and instantly kill it. Is some powerful water. Good job Link didn't get thirsty on the trip over, eh? Doom 2 introduced a host of new enemies for you to blast into ludicrous jibs. From the flamethrower toting mancubi to the nightmarish revenants to the arch vile who undoes all your hard work by bringing enemies you've killed back to life. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. It took ages. The biggest and baddest of them all, however, is the Icon of Sin, the game's final boss who is a giant evil goat head that can spawn endless enemies, most of whom are keen to introduce you to the business end of a rocket launcher. To defeat the Icon of Sin, you have to fire rockets into the hole in its forehead, damaging its twisted brain, which is its one weak point and the source of all the evil in Doom 2. Or at least that's what we thought at the time. If you use the no-clip cheat, you can head on in there yourself to have a look at the Icon of Sin's weak spot firsthand, where you discover that everything is being orchestrated by the severed head of Doom designer John Romero. Still, it's pretty impressive that he got all this set up with no body to help him. Huh? Fine. Once you know this, this once formidable boss fight becomes a simple case of punching an unarmed John Romero head in the face until either the game ends or your fire button finger gets tired. I guess that's one Don't way to... Say that's one way to get ahead. I wasn't going to. Okay, then finish the sentence. I guess that's the end of this segment. Thank you for watching it. Those, my friends, were nine of the weird weaknesses that bosses don't want you to find out about. So, in your face, those bosses, because the word's out, it's everywhere. Give it up, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what else have we got for you? Well, videos, let me tell you. Internet videos, such as these from Outside Xbox, and these from Outside Extra, which is the very friendly sister channel that is new, but not that new anymore. You probably should have heard about it. Where have you been? 